Year 18. The Second Rule of Iba. I had died. I died in the holy fire set by that damned cult of holistic detective. But that wasn't the end. Oh no. I'd come to Headshoots not to tax its adamantine riches as I told everyone else, no. I came to Headshoots because of what else was found in the depths. The eerie, glowing pits. A portal to hell itself. I barely had time to investigate before some mad fool killed me, but I'd learned enough. In my dying moments, I made a pact with the forces that dwelt beneath the earth. My soul is theirs. But now it's time for them to uphold their part of the bargain. I will have revenge. As if in a trance, Holistic Detective and Nemo 2342 shambled down through the mines to gaze upon the eerie red glow from the pit. The greatest strength of this fortress has no doubt been its invincible champions, particularly these two, the strongest swords dwarf who ever lived, Nemo 2342, and the dwarf wearing trail machines, the Fellowship of Right, Professor Bling's greatest work, the strongest armor conceivable, Holistic Detective. These two were the only dwarves to survive the invasion of the demons. And now, they would be the demons. There was a flash, a swirling of energy, and the two champions shrieked as their flesh and souls melted from their body. What remained was no longer dwarven at all. Armor clattered around bone as the two beings turned to the stairs, and Headshoots was doomed. The warriors shamble up from the underworld, while the fortress remains unawares. But for the clatter of bones beneath their armor, there's nothing to suggest that today is the last day of headshoots. The first blood belongs to a cow. Nemo casually decapitated it as the warriors began to stalk the hallways. Haiku Yutu, a young child, goes out to investigate and is instantly killed and thrown across the room by Nemo. And then the first champion steps up to try and stop these creatures. Tyskill. Tyskill tries to strike Nemo while he's distracted, but he's casually blocked and propelled through the air by the counter-strike, smashing right into Holistic Detective. It seems Nemo doesn't have much respect for Holistic. The ultimate sword and the ultimate armor have fought on the same side their whole existence, but perhaps it is each other they're destined to fight. Well... For now, they test themselves on the rest of the fortress champions. Nemo ambushes the good professor, stabbing him through, throwing him across the room, and then decapitating his unconscious body. Meanwhile, Holistic is sick of Nemo's guff, and goes up several floors to topple some statues where she's ambushed by two champions in quick succession. Her first opponent is Traxxas IV. She brutally smashes Traxxas with her backpack, preferring its slow, sadistic nature to her quick and deadly axe. You'll notice that Orange Soda II is trying to sneak up on her. Well, there is no pictures from that resulting encounter, just this abridged combat log to give you a taste of the brutality of Holistic's fighting style. Bashes in the right upper arm with her giant rat leather backpack. The head arrest smith's right shoulder has been strained. Bashes in the right lower leg. His right knee has been badly sprained. Bashes in the head. His neck has been badly bruised. Bashes in the upper arm. Twice. Bashes in the upper body. Bashes in the left foot. His left foot has been badly bruised and terribly bruised. Bashes in the left upper arm. His shoulder has been strained. Bashes in the right foot. His second toe has been bruised. Bashes in the right foot. Bashes in the right hand. Bashes in the left lower arm. Twenty-one individual blows later, Orange Soda lays dead. The first one knocked him out. The rest were just savage, rapid, brutal blows with the bag. You can see why Holistic Detective doesn't use her axe. It would be a mercy. 
While that's going on, Nemo is hunting down defenseless civilians and reducing them to a red mist. The slaughter continues as they both get used to the feel of dwarves dying at their hands. Nemo pursues and cuts down the craft dwarf VLH L. Holistic corners the miner Tag Plastic and Little Febreze Ninja. Tag Plastic uses the child as a decoy to escape. The child dies. Untested recruit Skay tries to confront Holistic. His upper body is collapsed into a lump of gore by Holistic's backpack. At least he tried. The champion, Rebuilt Box, confronts Nemo. His blow is blocked, and Nemo stabs through both his nose and neck at once. But Box isn't finished yet. Nemo chops off three of his limbs before cutting him in two. Here's an example of your standard Nemo combat log. Nemo hacks at the right lower leg with his obsidian short sword. The right lower leg flies off in a bloody arc. Hacks at the right upper arm, it flies off. Hacks at the left upper arm, it flies off. Hacks at the right upper leg, it is cut. The arrest smith's right hip has been sprained. Hacks at the upper body, it is cloven asunder. Rebuilt box is propelled away by the force of the blow. They have been struck down. Back to Holistic Detective, the most dangerous champion has already appeared. By raw strength, the champion Volmarius is the third strongest in the fortress, after Nemo and Holistic, of course. This is going to be Holistic's most dangerous battle. Volmarius wields a metal boot, like Holistic wields her bag. I imagine that Volmarius saw Holistic as something of a role model, and tried to mimic her fighting style. Well, now the student must face the master, or at least the soulless skeletal abomination that the master has become. Boot versus bag. Vomaria starts off strong, getting a solid blow in through Holistic's armor. Does he stand a chance? They spar with deadly seriousness, neither able to land a blow. But Vomarius can't last. Bashes in the right upper leg with his steel low boot. The skeletal deathsmith's right hip has been sprained. Strikes at, but the shot is blocked. Counter-strike, miss. The arrest smith's left elbow has been broken. Again, bashes in the head with her giant rat leather backpack. The arrest smith's brain has been broken. That's the end of the fight, but not the end of the beating. SWAT Jester Redux makes a surprise lunge at Holistic while she's occupied and gets crippled by the counterattack. Holistic turns back to Vomarius and strikes again and again with her bag, again and again and again. Oh, oh God, she, she won't stop. How much can Vomarius take? In the end, Vomarius takes 25 blows before Holistic lines up a big strong one to launch him into the air. Before he even lands, Holistic turns her attention back to Swat Jester, still writhing in agony. Five rapid-fire blows, and Swat Jester's lower body collapses into a lump of gore, and he gets smashed down the hallway. Amazingly, Vomarius' body is still lazily tumbling through the air. And, oh, ho, ho, did, did you see that? Holistic totally just beamed that cow with Swat Jester's body like, pow, smashed it good. And all of this before Vomarius' body hit the ground. I swear, no one better make fun of Holistic for fighting with a bag, because even if you're the strongest damn dwarf in the fortress, she can use it to kill you, then kill someone else, and beat a cow with the second corpse before you hit the ground. Damn. Holistic pursues the stunned calf and Tag Plastic. Tag Plastic again uses an innocent as a shield and tries to escape, this time... It's useless. Holistic tracks Tag Plastic down and beats him, mercilessly, twelve blows before the release of death. Nemo, meanwhile, massacres more civilians by the food stockpile. Spooky Lizard II loses two limbs before his head. Athlete's footnote is cut in two with a single blow. Tinny Tim is cornered in the farms and is decapitated in one move. Gogozer is cloven and twain by the depot. Nemo didn't see the merchants, unfortunately. They lived to take a pot shot at him. 
Holistic kills a few animals and then explodes Mark Scorm with her backpack. Explodes. There's bits of Mark Scorm all over the hallway now. She snuffs out Great Badger more neatly. The two, though on opposite sides of the fortress, take a break to have a statue toppling contest. Holistic wins, four to two. These guys just hate statues. Holistic continues her killing spree. I Am Lemon only withstands three blows. Coincidentally, they're blown into three parts upon impact with the wall. Lackloss lures Holistic into the small old barracks. It didn't end well. He took four blows and then died. Nice Aaron is the next on the list, seven blows. Flock of Mice tries to get in a sucker punch but is blocked and it's crippled by the counter-strike. Holistic kills a few cows before going back to him. But Flock of Mice is having none of that. He manages to step on Holistic, forcing her to the ground. And then he gets another strike in. Flock of Mice, you're the best. You had no skills, no status. You were just a lowly peasant. You didn't even get a fun profession name until I gave you one. Hero. Why is Flock of Mice a hero? He tried. Against insurmountable odds, he tried. While everyone else simply ran and was bagged down, he stood up and fought. Him and him alone. Two dwarves in this whole massacre even touched Holistic. The ultimate remaining champion, Vomarius, and the meek peasant, Flock of Mice. He died in two blows, but he gave as many as he took. Holistic goes to finish off a couple of resting wounded dwarves, Mortal Sword and Frog the Third. They're each killed with a single blow to the head. I guess Holistic was feeling merciful, though Frog the Third is still plastered on the wall pretty well. Moonin does something noticeable by going stark raving mad. Turns out that Holistic killed his dog and Nemo eviscerated a guy right in front of him. Poor guy. That makes me think a bit. Let's take the spotlight off of our skeletal deathsmiths. Let's have a look at the impact of the massacre on the civilians. Here we have four defenseless dwarves, the pampered Countess Consort, Otsp, and the two infants she carries with her, White Cloak the Second and Nippy the Fish, as well as an unrelated child she's brought with her, Oni Alem. They fled from the screams of terror and maniacal laughter surrounding the skeletal champions, and are seeking refuge on top of the mountain, under a small outcropping near where the wagons once stood that brought the original seven dwarves to head shoots. They huddled together with the donkeys, hoping not to draw any attention to themselves. The Count is dead, and Oni Alem has lost his best friend and his parents he's not doing so well, and mostly just quietly weeps. Otsp is more resolute, as she's determined to live for the sake of her children. If there's any sort of loving God in this world, surely this poor innocent group will be spared. But no. Holistic crests the hill. As soon as the skeletal warrior's blood-stained bones are visible, they run as fast as they can, but Holistic Detective is faster. She strikes down the donkeys with her bag, right and left, leaving a trail of blood and gore behind herself. Oni Alem trips. Otsp can't afford to look back. She doesn't hesitate for the sake of her own children. Holistic bashes in the upper body with her giant rat leather backpack. It is mangled. The child is having trouble breathing. The child's right and left lungs have been pierced. Holistic leaves him there to suffocate. His rib cage was crushed in by the bag, leaving his chest a bloody, gurgling mess. He desperately tries to breathe, but it just results in a sick, squelching sound in his wound. He knows he'll be dead soon. He wishes it were sooner. Otsp has gained a little ground. In her heart, she's glad for the distraction Oni provides. Part of her knows she should feel bad about that, but she doesn't. Her life, her children, she doesn't care about anything else. That crimson, clattering, spattered, blood-soaked skeletal monstrosity is gaining on her fast. Crash, crash, crash! Every rapid step it takes, an unnatural cacophony of poorly fitted armor on raw bone. She closes her eyes tight as she runs, but that only makes her more conscious of how much closer it sounds with each step. She can almost feel it breathing down her neck. She turns her head and opens one eye to check when 
Holistic bashes in the upper body with her giant rat leather backpack. It collapses into a lump of gore. The baby is propelled away by the force of the blow. The creature had taken a wide swing and caught her baby in the chest, and off it flew. She stumbled as she watched it cartwheel through the air, spinning end over end, blood spraying out of the tiny being's mangled remains. It landed with a sickening squelch. Her baby. Her nippy the fish, he was dead. She had to save White Cloak the second. She, she had to, but Holistic was on her already. The bag came down and smashed her head into her body. An unrecognizable mess. Holistic takes her time with White Cloak the second, primarily smashing her limbs and extremities, breaking almost all of her fingers and toes before finally killing her. Several minutes later, Oni Alem mercifully suffocates. I... I am responsible for this. I've... unleashed this thing. All of a sudden, destroying the fortress doesn't feel all that cool anymore. What's left is primarily mopping up. Nemo has been busy down by the food stockpile. He slices off three of Bob and Threadbear's fingers before cutting him in half. The backstroke catches Clance McGraw, who is trying to sneak up on Nemo. His upper body was cloven asunder. Robert Dedford, the last of our non-crippled military, has a go at Nemo. He loses his upper body, gasps, and then dies. Flymolo is minced somewhere in there, too. Holistic returns to the fortress and goes to town on the child's spoon boy. Oh, oh God, she's... She's still going at it. She's still... Oh, sweet Christ, that poor kid. Twenty-one. That kid survived twenty-one blows. Only champions approach that level. More mopping up. Holistic puts Moon in the mat out of his misery. Two strikes. She finishes off some cows and a few statues. When Viki bursts out of a door, much to his misfortune... A single blow to the head finishes him. Kennel the second proves no more resilient and dies shortly after. Not many dwarfs left. Raelius wanders the hallways, putting body parts in tombs, appearing unaware that the skeletal champions still stalk the halls. He's made aware by a single blow from Holistic's bag. We're down to only one living dwarf and the cripples. It seems as if Gex has gone somewhere the bloody skeletons can't find. Heck, he's gone somewhere I can't find. I've been scouring for him for ages. I finally just go to the unit screen and zoom to him, and oh, that explains it. For those of you with a very good memory, this is the maze leading to the room outside of space. It's a room that cannot be found unless a dwarf is in it and you zoom to him. I don't know who made it. Perhaps no one did. It's very mysterious. And Gex is a crafty bugger as he's brought berries down there with him and is now taking a nap on the rock floor. I mean, he can get to a bed, but he's making sure to stay hidden in this room. That dwarf really, really wants to live. He's so keen on self-preservation that he's breaking his programming as I know it. After the emotional drain of the consort incident, I'm feeling merciful. Gex can live. But what of our champions? They still have unfinished business with each other. This is Headshoots. To your left, that blue edifice is the old entrance. That's the mouth of the old weapon system. I myself was the only one to actually deploy it. On our own dwarves as it happened. On the horizon, you'll notice tribute over the lake of lava and attached to it is a lava duct, making it Weapon Tribute. Where it ends is the current entrance to our fortress. But the reason I took this picture is the structure in the foreground. It's been there for years, unused. It was an unfinished project, a ruin that was never anything but a ruin. I think the original plans had a fountain on top, but it's seen nothing but wind and rain. After construction ceased, no one ever went up there again. Until now. Now, 
Holistic Detective and Nemo 2342 stand, face to face, a thick layer of blood covering both their fleshless skulls, a thick layer of sin covering their soulless hearts. The setting sun glints off their blood-caked armor. Holistic hefts her bag, Nemo wipes uselessly at the vomit and ichor, dulling his obsidian sword. Beneath the layers of grime and ooze, the breastplate of Holistic Detective, Trail Machines, the Fellowship of Right, still bears the image of that old nemesis, Lance Lantern, the Fire Imp. Lance Lantern died over a decade ago. Headshoots died earlier that day. And now, here in the crimson evening sky, a champion will also die. The dwarves both become filled with an unnatural rage as they charged at one another. Nemo started off quick, his swordsmanship really showing as he got off two blows on Holistic's left arm, the second one taking off Holistic's left hand. Holistic was now without a shield and had no defense against the coming blows. No defense, except for a set of artifact adamantine plate mail, that is. Nemo's next furious blow was straight to the head, stabbed clean through. It would have been fatal if Holistic Detective were not undead. The next blow through her gut was similarly useless. Nemo 2342 made a vicious charge at Holistic, knocking her over and cutting off her right hand. Holistic looked to be in dire straits. She hadn't landed a single blow all fight and had already lost both hands. Her trademark bag fell sixteen floors to the earth below. But it was not over. Holistic bit Nemo in the head. Yes, Nemo cut off both of Holistic Detective's hands, so she fought with her teeth. Nemo broke free, but Holistic continued, making a go at his hand before latching on with her jaw to his ribcage. Nemo flailed at Holistic, but it was too late. Holistic summoned all the strength of her body and violently shook at Nemo, completely shattering his ribcage. Nemo's arms and head crumpled to the ground, lifelessly. Holistic Detective had won, and Headshoots was gone. Appendix E Just one more day by Armok's beard, Gex cried as he tossed and turned on the stone. Just one more day! They would send more dwarves, stronger ones, when the county of Headshoes failed to meet with the traitor sent by the mountain home. Gex knew this, as he knew he would be safe when the screaming started, if he could only flee to the dark places where even the undead would not go. He'd taken a risk, gathering as much food and booze as he could while the fortress died around him. But he could not save his companions. No. They would be sacrificed to the false gods his people had worshipped in this cursed place. The ones twisted by fear and greed of the demons they had unleashed upon the world. Or perhaps it was Armok and the Pantheon themselves, angry at the mortals who would dare hold themselves up and say, We too are unbound by weakness. For that was the sin of headshoots, not greed though the dwarves had dug deep. Not wrath, though the dwarves had slain many undeserving creatures. Not envy, though the nobles did cry for more, for better, for that which was given to those most deserving. Nor was it lust, or gluttony, or sloth. No, it was pride. The pride of the dwarven people, personified in rock and magma. It was the pride of the deathsmiths and murdersmiths and arrestsmiths, believing themselves invincible, right up to the point where those they'd held up as the purest examples of their might became their downfall. How ironically appropriate, thought Gex during the first few days of his exile into the depths. He didn't think much of these things anymore. The time for thinking had come and gone. The time for the food he'd smuggled down below while the screams were fresh in his mind had come and gone. 
the time for the booze that he had grabbed, grabbed while he watched Spoon Boy be beaten again and again with a ratskin backpack as he cried to Gex for help. The time for that booze had come and gone. All that remained for Gex was the image of a dwarven rescue party firm in his mind. They would come, and they would save him from the pride that had doomed his people. They would save him because he had not lost his faith, because he had defeated his pride, because when Armok told him to repent and he had the choice between his pride and survival, he chose to run in shame. Hunger washed over him, and he lapped up the blood of some unidentifiable vermin that had walked too close. He tasted in that blood the best alcohol he had ever drunk. One more day. Just one more day. Appendix F. Journal of the Fourth Investigation and Reclamation Expedition. Day 1. We finally arrived on the outskirts of the area designated on our maps as head shoots. Our task is to find out what happened to the two search parties and the one rescue party that came before us. Unlike those parties, though, we've brought some real dwarven soldiers rather than just some militia recruits and caravan guards. Two squads of five, led by hammerlords, should be sufficient protection for the rest of us. We've all heard the stories of head shoots, how demons and undead cower in the surrounding areas in fear of the fortress, how their champions have slain dragons and titans single-handedly. Let me state... That's nothing but fairy tales made to scare our children into not wandering off into the wilds. I've no doubt that there are dangers out here, undead wildlife and such, but they're hardly a threat to skilled and attentive dwarves. Those before us must have let their guard down a foolish and elven mistake. We'll be setting up camp outside the blighted ground before beginning our search in earnest. I doubt we could get any real rest under the bleak and stormy sky that seems to permanently hover over the entire region. Day 2. Goblins. When we first laid our eyes upon the ragtag group of skittish little green monsters, we thought that they might have been the reason for the disappearance of one of our previous groups. But then they saw us, and they all screamed in what could only be described as absolute terror, and fled in all directions. I heard one yell something about... The detective has found us. No one among us was sure what that meant. Hell, we weren't even aware goblins knew any words longer than six letters, apart from their own convoluted names. They did leave behind their possessions, though, so we decided to add what little food the things had left to our own packs. The ground beneath our feet, which looked like stone at first, actually crumbled a bit beneath us. It was a mixture of dead soil and ash, so barren that it looked like solid rock from a distance. One of the dwarves protecting us made a snarky comment about me having cave adaption. There's nothing wrong with my vision. He won't be receiving rations tonight. Consulting our maps and what reports we had, the entrance would be impossible to miss. But we also noted that there were supposed to be several other entrances that were otherwise sealed or concealed. Perhaps we should take one of those. Whatever befell our comrades, they likely must have went straight for the front entrance, and if even a tiny fraction of what we heard is true, that might be certain death. Day 3. Well, we found the local wildlife. Or rather, they found us. Various undead creatures assaulted our group this afternoon, most notable some skeletal fire imps. Which made me wonder how the hell that works. These things can still fling fire at us, despite just being a bunch of barely held together bones? Our soldiers earned their keep today, although one of the green recruits got burned pretty badly by a couple of those imps who thought it'd be funny to take turns throwing jets of fire at his backside. He's being taken care of by the party's doctor for now. Someone in our group brought up the question of why they were all centered around here and not attacking us anywhere else in the wasteland. A bit of searching revealed there to be a nest and a gathering of them around a hill with a strangely flat top. Closer inspection showed a concealed passage leading down. It was beginning to get late by then, however, so we've decided to set up nearby and wait till tomorrow morning to go in. Day 5. Shit. Turns out that what was above was just the tip of the proverbial iceberg. There are tons of zombified animals down here. 
A lot of undead cats for some reason, which is bizarre since I've never seen an undead cat before. And also, why so many? Was Hedgehoots breeding these things for profit? One of our diggers was ambushed and devoured before we could reach him, and in the ensuing struggle, two of our guards were killed. More were coming in behind us from some path we didn't notice before, so we had to keep moving in till we found a place to hole up. We found a room with a strong door and shut ourselves inside. Someone has smashed a hole into the door somehow, but one of our hammerlords took the opportunity to smash any zombies who poked their heads through it. Of course, this was yesterday, and they're still at it trying to claw down the door while our soldiers take turns keeping anything from getting through the hole that was slowly getting bigger. Guess we know what happened to the others, huh? This room is strange. There's a lot of bones in here. Many of them look dwarven, but not all of them. At least they aren't pulling together and getting up to bash our heads in. Day 8. Fuck this place. The noise ceased after another day of killing undead animals trying to claw through the door. It looked like they'd stopped coming. Well, they did. But that didn't mean they were gone. We didn't think of that, though. <laughs> we decided to move on. But before we left, I noticed a small journal, much like this one, clutched in a skeletal hand. I grabbed it before catching up with the rest of the group. Could make for some reading, I thought, once we stop again. Well, that didn't take long. We noticed that the further we went down, the more it looked like we were going through mining tunnels. We finally came upon one level where it seemed more dug through than the others. Closely inspecting the walls, we noticed that there were traces of an adamantine vein. It looked to be only the tip, the rest going down deeper into the tunnels below. It was only then that I noticed that we were walking through earlier it looked like it was dug more recently than the rest. This tunnel in particular was a good contrast, but the way the debris was laid out, it looked like the newer tunnels were being dug upwards instead. We found out why. Fucking tentacle demon. Yeah, one of those nightmarish elven sexual fantasies was lurking around that floor. That poor sword store for recruit. The thing picked him up and literally ripped his head and spine out from the rest of his body before hurling it at us. That was before any of us could react. Our guards had more guts than the rest of us did, because they immediately charged the damn thing. Being ganged up on, it didn't even have a chance to strike again. But oh, if only that were a straggler. There's at least two more nearby that came slithering along to join the brawl. Being attacked from both sides, we lost a couple more soldiers and our second-to-last digger before they were subdued. But of course, that couldn't just be it. Oh, no. Somehow, one was coming down the stairs we'd just come from. He set his sights on our last miner, Armok. Bless that dwarf, he knew he was fucked. So he took his pickaxe and went down the next flight of stairs to the area below us. The thing followed him right down, ignoring us. Lots of unholy screeches and growls rose up suddenly as he left our sight. There were a couple of grunts from the dwarf before the floor shook a little. The stairwell and the supports around it collapsed on top of him and the monster after him, effectively sealing off the lower levels since we had no miners left. Or at least, no digging implements anyway. Why were we given only three? Well, now we can't go back up. Because those bastards somehow came in behind us. We're stuck here. By Armok, we're fucked. Day 11. <laughs> oh, shit. No more food. And, and guess what? The room we were in with all the bones? That journal that we found out was the first search party. We walked into the same goddamn death trap that they did. Oh, that journal I picked up was theirs. What luck! Of course, I couldn't have told everyone to stop and let me read it. Therefore, avoiding all of this, oh, no, that would have made sense. And sense is something that this fort obviously doesn't have. <sighs> we couldn't even get into the main part of the fort. 
If this is the mining tunnels, which they obviously sealed off any path leading into the fort, then what the fuck happened up there to make them all disappear? We've... We've had to eat one of our slain comrades to survive, so... So now we're cannibals, too. Half of our team has gone nuts and killed themselves, and half of what was left turned on each other. I... I know better, though. It's... It's just me, our cook, and our last hammer lord now. We won't be the last to come by here, I know it. Someone will come. Although we're running out of corpses to eat. We'll have to find something else. Maybe, maybe our hammer lord. It's not like we'll be fighting anything. Wow. The rest of the page is splattered in blood. The corpse found over it had its head smashed in, and various pieces of its body were consumed. Epilogue by Mortal Sword That's certainly one way head shoots might have ended, though the legends are many. Some say, instead of being corrupted by the forces of hell, the champions of head shoots marched the entire fortress into the inferno vowing to either conquer or annihilate it, and have not been heard from since. Others say that the champions were possessed of such awesome power that they transcended this world and that Headshoots was pulled entire into the realm of the divine, anchor to a brand new pantheon that would eventually displace the old gods. And there are even those who say, that head shoots never ended at all, and that it will stand hidden from the eyes of mortals until holistic detective Harbinger of the Apocalypse marches forth to bring an end to all things, including time itself. But all dwarves today agree on one thing, if one thing alone— to speak the true name of the fortress, or any of its champions, aloud, is to draw something's attention. And such power, focused on a single point, is rarely, if ever, beneficial to the invoker. <laughs>